We have to start with the Dubai Desert Classic. We have to start with Treegate and Teagate and the, the final round that was also interesting. And I will preface all of this by saying Patrick Reed seems to play his best golf when he's the most controversial. When, when everything is up against him, he plays his best golf. And he played really good golf on Monday. And he gave Rory McIlroy an incredible challenge in the final round of the Hero Dubai Desert Classic on the DP World Tour. He could have very easily won the tournament. And, and really, he probably shouldn't have won the tournament because we'll talk about Treegate and Teagate. Well, Treegate was the problem other than Teagate. And uh, it still was a really entertaining watch. I hope you got to watch some of it. Replay, I think, will be aired another time today on One Golf Channel. I saw it this morning. And it was a great finish with McIlroy birdieing the 71st and 72nd holes in fairly dramatic fashion to win the tournament by one. And then you had a good finish behind that as well with uh, Lucas Herbert and Callum Shinkwin. I mean, it was, it was a good tournament, really enjoyable to watch. And Rory McIlroy gets his first Rolex Series win. But let's talk first about Treegate, and then maybe we'll touch on Teagate since that's several days old. So let's talk Treegate. If you didn't see it, you have, yeah, I mean, you have yesterday, you have... Patrick Reed on the 17th hole at Emirates Golf Club. It is a drivable green. It's not that long of a hole. You can either kind of lay up to a fairway that is angled off of the tee box that creates a mini dog leg of sorts, or you can be extremely aggressive, try to go over or to the right of and draw off of a cluster of three or four trees. I think it's three trees that kind of make up the corner of this imagined dog leg. If you, cut, if you go over or around, you have a chance to drive the green, maybe make an eagle, but almost certainly going to make a birdie. It, it's an exciting hole. Actually, in a lot of ways, Emirates Golf Club reminds me of TPC Scottsdale, where it's not the best architectural golf course in the world, but it sure is exciting, and it's fun to watch play. So, Patrick Reed hits his tee shot, 17th hole, winds up going clearly into a palm tree. There's three palm trees in this, this cluster, and the TV cameras pick it up really well, and they show... Patrick Reed's ball clearly going into palm tree number one. If you're looking at it from the TV camera angle, it's the one to the right. And then there are two to the left, one back, one closer. Well, Reed comes towards this area to try to find his ball. He recognizes it's probably in a tree. You've got an official with the European tour. You've got a couple of them. You've got spotters slash marshals there. And they say, oh, the ball went into a different tree. And so they wind up barking up the wrong tree, so to speak. They look up the tree, and under the rules of golf, if you can positively identify your golf ball in the tree, and you have a couple of different ways of doing that, then you can say, well, there's my ball. Take an unplayable lie from up in the tree, directly straight down to the ground, and then you get your relief off of that. But you have to positively identify your ball. And you can do that in one of basically three ways. One, you can climb the tree and pluck it out and go, here it is. That's not happening in a palm tree. You could also identify it based on a, variety, a couple of different sets of characteristics. So you could say, okay, I mark my ball this way, and then when you spot a ball with your ball, there it is. Or you can have playing partners help verify. There's a bunch of different options available to it, but ultimately... Reed and the officials were looking up at the wrong tree. And Reed then says, oh, well, that's my ball. I see the arrow on it, implying that he had an arrow mark on the ball. And he describes it to the officials, and they are satisfied that he has positively identified the ball. And they gave him relief. Well, not only did they give him incorrect relief because that wasn't the right tree, he was closer to the hole because he was at the wrong tree. And he didn't have to take a stroke and distance penalty, which is what he would have had to do if he couldn't find the ball and positively identify it, because then it would be lost. Even though you know where it is, you can't identify it. You have to go back to the tee, take the penalty, and you're hitting three from there. He also had the option, by the way, if he had found the ball, of climbing up the tree and playing it. Obviously, that's not really going to happen with a palm tree, but that is an option to the rules of golf. You can play the ball out of a tree if you wish. We've seen Sergio Garcia, among others, do it over the years. It's crazy, but you can do it. Um, so then Reed winds up making bogey. And I think he was four shots down after 54 holes. The tournament obviously had its third round on Sunday because of torrential rain, of all things, in Dubai. And Reed talks afterwards like he was 100% on board 
with what had happened. It was 100% his ball that he wouldn't have done anything different uh, uh, you know, than what he did. If it weren't his ball, he absolutely would have gone back to the tee and hit three and all this stuff. But then you see the footage of it. And it's clear from the folks at the DP World Tour Productions that they're showing the ball going into that first tree. There is almost zero chance that the ball went backwards and then around like a Zapruder film, like back into the right, to then go into the tree in front of it. It's physically almost impossible for that to have happened. So they wound up looking in the wrong tree. But because it's a scenario about getting the proper ruling, if you get a bad ruling from an official, it's still the ruling, and you have to go with that. So that's why he wasn't disqualified. That's why he didn't get a bigger penalty. But just the, the discussion with which he had with the official and then with whatever media was there after the fact that, oh, yeah, this is definitely my ball. You know, this is, this is mine. And, and it wasn't. I mean, it just wasn't. Now, here's the thing. If you look at a close-up of the ball that he wound up playing the rest of the hole with, you can see there's a, a fairly common marking involved. And it's a kind of a black line, and it looks like it maybe it's over the uh, titleist provided marking that, you know, or with a provided marking on the side of the ball. And a lot of players will just draw an arrow over that, whatever color they wish. It's more common than you think. There are a lot of common styles of marking. That's one of them. So it's possible exactly what he said he saw and thought, hey, that's mine. That is absolutely plausible. But now we know he's looking up the wrong tree. So he wasn't identifying his ball. And at some point in the process, there you think, oh, there has to be some kind of consequence for that. But the rules of golf allow for this kind of leeway. And that's just kind of the reality of it. And the same thing is true when you're talking about dropping from a red stake hazard. It used to be called a lateral hazard. If you don't have clear evidence as to where the ball crossed the margin of the hazard last, you're technically making an improper ruling, but if you and your playing partners agree on a, on a pin position or a, pin, a point where you drop, a position where you crossed, and you make the drop from there, that's it. That's the end of it. If, if there's nothing to really scrutinize about it and the players agree, then you're good, and that's the end of it. So that's why Patrick Reed didn't get DQ'd or forced to add another stroke or anything like that, and it just makes him look bad because everyone involved that wasn't on the ground knew the tree that he was looking up was wrong. And Brandel Chambly and Golf Channel did a great job of kind of breaking it all down in somewhat mocking fashion. I mean, I think it was pretty evident from anyone watching on TV what had happened. But then you always get in your mind with Patrick Reed because of past incidents, is there malice? Is there, is this intentional? Or is it just kind of weird happenstance that this always happens to him? And I don't know the answer to that, but it is a question that comes up a lot, and it just so also happens that Rory McIlroy, a guy who's so very much public front and center and anti-Liv, is watching him do this, and then he probably doesn't know the entire circumstance around it, but McIlroy had an interesting ruling earlier in the, in the day about margin and where you drop, and that's why I kind of bring that up about the realities of having to have your players agree with you and the information that you have versus that you have off of TV. If you have a TV camera there, there's a lot to digest there. But it just, McElroy has defended Reed a couple of different times over the years regarding rules related incidents or his personality. He's been not quite neutral about Patrick Reed in total, but overall generally pretty classy about it, I think. And I think that even goes more into what happened earlier in the week with McElroy not really wanting to acknowledge Reed on the, the practice tee. And I, I will keep this brief because this is a few days old, but I firmly believe Patrick Reed went into that situation thinking one of two things was going to happen. One, he was going to get into a physical or verbal altercation with Rory McElroy, and McElroy would look bad because he took the bait. Or Reed was going to get a positive rub because McElroy would stand up and shake his hand, even though Reed's attorney served McElroy with a subpoena in an unrelated lawsuit to Patrick Reed on Christmas freaking Eve. So there's no reason for McElroy to be nice to Reed, knowing the association Reed has to his attorney, even if he didn't directly hand him the subpoena and it isn't directly involved in this lawsuit that Larry Klayman has filed. 
But the reaction that McElroy gave was pretty well spot on. I mean, he knew it couldn't work out either way. McElroy's a pretty smart guy. He knew it wouldn't work out either way. And he probably knew in the back of his mind, in that moment, the best thing he could do was ignore the guy. Because then in that case, Reed doesn't get what he wants, either in terms of a positive affirmation or a negative situation. The best thing you can do is be as neutral as you can, and that means saying nothing. And I know some people took that as slant, an opportunity to slam McElroy, but if you ever got sued by somebody's attorney and they walked up to you in public and wanted to make good, I, I don't think you would react much differently than McElroy would. I, I'm pretty certain you wouldn't react a whole lot better. I, I will cop to that as a human being. I definitely wouldn't. So I, I think that worked out as about as well as it could for McElroy and Reed really had nothing to lose there, so I guess it worked out pretty well for him also. So great tournament, really interesting to watch, and a good Monday finish. Nice little way to start the week uh, if, you're, if you're at home instead of at work, or if you're working from home.